Hi everybody and welcome to Muddiest Points on Interrupts, the second one of these that I've recorded this semester. Uh, today this is going to be a two-parter, so this is part one, what are interrupts and why are they useful. Uh, the second part, is, uh, which I'm going to post later, probably next week, uh, is part two on the interrupt controller module registers and walking through the cold code example again. So basically the, the big deal behind interrupts is that they're an asynchronous signal. It's what we call an interrupt request. There's actually two parts to them. There's the interrupt request and there's the function that runs as a response to the interrupt request. The interrupt request, also known as an IRQ, it can happen, it's a signal that can happen anytime. This is why it's asynchronous. It doesn't happen on a synchronized clock. It doesn't happen um, uh, synchronized with some event in the system. It can happen anytime. And it's usually generated by a peripheral, like a timer or an analog to digital converter or some other system uh, when something notable happens. In response to that interrupt requ request, there's a interrupt service routine, which is a function that runs a function, just a normal uh, function like you would call from any other program uh, that runs when the interrupt occurs. And you can see why this is useful because we don't have to sit and watch for the interrupt request to come al along in software, it happens in hardware. And every function, uh, inter every interrupt service routine is associated with a specific interrupt request or interrupt source and, that, and this function ex executes whenever the associated uh, IRQ occurs. So why are these things useful? The reason why is because it allows us to monitor and respond to processes without continually checking on them. If we have a piece of software that uh, needs to do a bunch of different things, basically some basic multitasking, um, it usually will have to uh, look at one thing, then look at the next thing, look, then look at this other thing, and keep cycling through looking at each of those things to respond to events from them um, as fast as it can. And sometimes while it's doing one of those other two things, it might miss one of the, one of the events that's coming across. Here, let me, let me do an illustrated example. We've got a deaf baker. So here we've got our, our deaf baker. He's baking bread. He's got two ovens going, right? And he's deaf, so he can't hear the alarm when it goes off. So he, he just keeps looking at the alarms to see if they've done, uh, keeps looking at the bread to see if they've done baking. He looks back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and, and is frantically watching these two. Now say one of these, one of these uh, uh, pieces of bread it has become done. He got, rushes over, rushes over, somewhere along here, there we go. He rushes over, takes it out of the oven, and starts slicing it. Now while he's slicing it, say the other piece of bread, uh, the other piece of bread is done in the other, other oven. He can't hear the alarm go off, he's not checking the alarm anymore because he's slicing his piece of bread, his bread, and uh, ends up burning his whole house down, right? This is a terrible outcome. We miss the bread, we burn the bread, his ba bakery is burned down, and it's a terrible disaster. We want to try to avoid this. So, Let's try this with interrupts. Now the baker has a pager, so something that vibrates whenever his uh, one of the two pieces of bread is done, right? So same thing is happening, and, and instead of the baker having to watch the two uh, 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 watch the two ovens and making sure that they're not you know catching fire and the bread doesn't get burned and things like that, when um, when one of the uh, pieces of bread is done, the pager will buzz, he'll go and start slicing the bread, but he's still got the pager, right? He can hold on to the pager so that when it buzzes again for the other uh, oven, he can stop slicing the bread, go take it out of the oven, finish slicing the first piece of bread, slice the second piece of bread, and go back to sitting on the beach drinking mojitos. Right, which is pretty cool. So this allows us to handle asynchronous events and do some really basic multitasking. Right, so anytime we have a time critical event and we don't want to spend all of our processor time waiting for something to happen, we can use interrupts to do a really simple form of multitasking, which makes sure that we handle events as they come in and we don't miss anything when they when it does uh, when they do occur. So what happens during an interrupt when? Uh, interrupts as a system are a function of hardware, right? And what this means is that interrupt sources are hardwired. All the peripherals such as timers and analog to digital converters are hard hardwired into the processor to generate interrupt requests. The, this also means that the functions associated with uh, actually, the slots for functions associated with interrupt service routines are hardwired. So the 
timer interrupt, when a timer uh, ticks down and it generates an interrupt, it's always going to look in slot 1. Similarly, when the analog to digital conversion uh, is complete, it might look in slot 2. Now these aren't correct, the, the slot numbers aren't correct for um, our processor, this is just an example, but you get the idea that every interrupt source has a dedicated slot, and inside of that slot we um, store the functions that should be executed when that interrupt occurs. So when the timer ticks down all the way and uh, reaches zero, the remove the bread function is going to execute and then uh, everybody's happy. We call this collection of slots associated with interrupts the interrupt vector table because this is a table of interrupt vectors or actually program addresses, function addresses, function pointers uh, that get executed whenever the associated entry in the uh, whenever the associated entry in the um, uh, table is activated. So whenever the source is activated, it looks up what function should be executed, executes that function, and everything's cool, right? So here's an example of what happens during an interrupt. And we're going to continue our Def Baker uh, sort of montage here. Uh, we've got our interrupt vector, we've got mo remove bread and measure temp, and we've got our two interrupt sources, and there's up to 63 in our system, but these are just examples. When the timer ticks down all the way, uh, the interrupt one will be triggered and we'll see what happens. In the meantime, we've got our, and this is kind of running in the background, the hardware is doing all of this stuff independent of what the main program is doing. We've set this up so that it runs independently, we don't have to worry about it. In our main We've got a little program that's running continuously uh, call, uh, called main, and uh, the program itself is sip a mojito, observe the ocean, and apply sunscreen. Repeat. Uh, apparently the little uh, Def Baker is very sensitive to sunshine, so he has to apply a lot of sunscreen. Anyway, while this is executing, the process is in the background of uh, converting an analog signal to digital and the timer going uh, ticking uh, continue to tick down. right? As the uh, once this ticks down all the way, it triggers an interrupt. And the first thing that happens is that the processor main pro program execution pauses. And what happens is it pauses right there at whatever it was executing. And the first thing it does is save the program context onto the stack. So whatever it was doing, it makes a kind of bookmark to that location and says, stop here. This is what I was doing last. I'm going to pick this up in a second after I handle the interrupt. And the way it does that is by storing the program counter, which is the location in the program that it's currently executing, and the current status register, which is the uh, result of the most recent calculation, uh, onto the stack. And so that's where we store our current program context. And that's a little bookmark that we store there. Once that storage is complete, the system looks up what the interrupt vector or the interrupt yeah what interrupt vector or interrupt service routine is associated with that interrupt so it looks in the interrupt vector table finds the remove bread function that we put there and then it starts executing that once that is done executing we it goes back restores the program context the program counter and the status register and execution starts up again like nothing at all happened and that's the whole process. So while that was happening, the, in a, the timer ticked down, the program was paused, we set a bookmark, we ran the interrupt um, service routine, and then resumed execution after we restored the bookmark, right? And that's the basic summary. Uh, an interrupt request can happen at any time during normal execution. This saves the program counter and status register, making a bookmark to where we left off. We process the interrupt cert we look up an interrupt service routine in the interrupt vector table we execute the interrupt service routine then we restore our bookmark the program and status register and normal execution resumes from there simple as pie so next uh, we're going to talk about the exact code on how this uh, is implemented and how this all works <laughs>